All right. Well, welcome, everyone. Um, I think we have hit a record for us today. Over a thousand people have signed up today. Um, and we're very excited to be talking with you about this new policy for international workers and students to immigrate today. Um, so um, you guys probably all know me and Zia. We are lawyers at uh, Law Mango G. Uh, we are uh, lawyers in Toronto. And um, many of you may have already uh, attended some of our webinars before. Uh, today, what we're going to be doing is we're going to change up the format a little bit. Um, both Zia and I will be doing a short presentation on the, uh, the basic rules for these uh, policies. But then afterwards, we are going to spend the majority of this webinar and stream your questions. We may or may not be able to get through all of your questions. Uh, we will we will try and, and do our best to see what we can do. Okay. All of you may have uh, are here because you likely would have heard that there are some exciting new policies. There are four streams that were announced and they're grouped into two main streams. It's for international students and international workers. Zia, you want to take it away and tell us about the students policy. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, so let's start by looking at the policies for students. So for this is specifically for individuals who have studied here and have completed their program of study. So you need to have graduated either in or after January 2017. So we're looking at the past four years. Okay, there's three categories of programs that we can look at. So either you've completed a degree, so for example, a bachelor's degree, a master's, your PhD, or you've done a one year, so an eight month non-degree program. So for example, a diploma or a certificate program where the study has led to uh, work in a specific occupation. So basically it's a skilled trade occupation that's listed in Annex A of the public policy. And then third, we have where individuals who have completed uh, either one or multiple programs where the combined length of these programs is at least two years. So here we see individuals who have done, for example, two one-year programs or one two-year diploma program. All of these would be acceptable for this stream. You do have to be currently employed in Canada. Okay, so that means you have to be working. Um, there's no restrictions that we see in the policies right now in terms of what type of work. So we're not seeing a distinction here between high skilled, low skilled, part time, full time, which is very exciting. Right now, the policies simply state that you have to be employed in Canada. However, you can't be self employed unless you're working as a physician. Okay, so we are looking for employment relationships. Now related to that, you do need to have a valid work permit or you have to be authorized to work in Canada right now, and you need to have temporary status or be eligible to restore your status. So either you're holding a work permit or a study permit in some cases, um, or you're eligible to restore your status. Um, now, also these policies do state that you have to be in Canada at the time that the application is both received by RRCC and when it is approved. So we are focusing on individuals who are physically here in Canada right now. There is a language component to this policy. Um, you need to have eligible uh, test scores, okay? So you can do either the IELTS, CELPIP for English, or you have the uh, TEF or TCF for French tests. The CLB level though is much lower than what we've seen in other PR programs. So here we only need a CLB of five in each of the categories. So in each of reading, writing, speaking, listening, you need to have a minimum of a CLB five. All of these public policies do require an intent to reside outside of Quebec. Okay, so we are looking at the uh, provinces that are not including Quebec for these public policies. Now, with the international student stream, there is a quota for the English side, okay? So anyone who is applying with their English test results, there's a maximum cap of 40,000 applications that IRCC will accept for this stream. We don't see a cap on the French speaker side. So 
uh, for anyone who has who does speak French, um, you do have that advantage there where there's no cap on the number of applications that IRCC will accept for the student stream. Okay, wonderful. Those lucky French speakers. Right. Um, yes. <laughs> All right. So for workers, here, here are the basics, okay? For workers, we are looking at the work experience that you have had in Canada. It has, you have to have at least one year in the last three years. So looking at your days, I want to see at least 52 weeks of work, okay? Then you have to have 1,560 hours, which is equal to an average of 30 hours. So 30 times 52 is 1,560. Now, if you have worked part-time 20 hours a week, but you have all together worked this amount, that is fine as well. It doesn't have to be only, you know, work that you've worked over 30 hours. You can add together your hours. So at least 52 weeks, at least 1,560 hours. Um, the work, the occupation is very important. It does not necessarily have to be high skilled. Many of the occupations on these lists are low skilled. Um, there are two streams, okay? There's, for, for stream A, there's an Annex A, and I, uh, I'm going to be sending out these slides to everyone who have, uh, who have registered for our webinar, and I've hyperlinked the policies there so you can actually check whether or not your occupation is on the stream or not, okay? So stream A, it's mostly um, healthcare workers, there's personal support workers, there are orderlies on there, community, um, community support work, uh, community uh, social workers. Um, so those are on there as well, okay? Um, if you are going to be stream A, stream A has a cap of 20,000, then everything, all your work has to be in these occupations. You could jump from different occupations. You could, for, for example, be, you know, a nurse for, for half of it and, uh, you know, a, a doctor for the other half, for example, okay? Um, but it all has to be in this Annex A list. There's another stream B, where it could be, it, so they have another list. And this list includes a lot of great occupations like cashiers and, uh, you know, shelf, uh, the, the, the stocks, uh, uh, shelf stalkers. Um, and um, I believe truck drivers are on there. Um, there are um, uh, all sorts of different, what, what are some of the other ones, uh, Zia, that you can think of? Um, some, uh, there's a lot of the agricultural as well. Yes. Agriculture workers. So don't think that just because you have been doing some, uh, low skilled work that your you wouldn't qualify because a lot of this work is actually low skilled. They want to look at essential services compared to that high skilled, low skilled work. Mm -hmm. If you are going to be doing stream B, um, then you can do some of the work in B, and if you've been doing some work in the stream and Annex A, you can also do that as well, okay? All right, then um, legal work experience. So the work experience that you have been doing, it has to be legal. So for example, if you are a student and you are working you know, more than 20 hours a week, some of those hours you may not be able to count if you weren't allowed to work that. Or if you didn't have status when you were working and you didn't have authorization to work, you wouldn't be able to. So you can only count the legal work experience. Again, this whole, you can't be self-employed, okay? Except as a medical doctor, and it's not just any medical doctor. If you're a physician and you're a fee-for-service physician with a health authority, then that is counted, but you can't, no one else can have self-employed work. And oftentimes people say, well, what's self-employed work? 
basically, if you own a significant part of the business that that could that is your employer, they could deem that to be self-employed work. Also, if you are working as a contractor, a con it's the difference between a uh, a contractor and a contract. Okay, a contract, somebody can be employed with an end date on a contract. That's fine. A contractor is someone who, for example, I'm going to hire someone to paint my house. Okay, when I hire them, I'm not going to be taking away um, CPP, EI income tax from their fee. They say, how much is it? They say, thousand. I give them thousand dollars. That's a contractor. Okay, so contractors are self employed. What normally we're going to be looking at is if you have a T4, a T4 and you don't own significant shares in the business where you have been employed. The second thing as Zia has talked about with the students, it's the same thing for workers. You have to be currently employed. You don't have to be currently employed in one of the Annex A or B streams, but you can be employed in anything. It could and it doesn't have to be full. It could be full time, part time, high skill, low skill, whatever job it is. You just have to be currently employed and working. OK, and you have to have a valid work permit or be authorized to work. Um, so for students, this becomes quite tricky. OK, so let's say you um, finish your program. If you have not applied for your postgrad work permit, then you can you are not authorized to work. You are only authorized to work after you have submitted your postgrad work permit. You're waiting for it, or if you hold a work permit. Okay. Temporary status, as Zia has already talked about. So you have to have either temporary status or be eligible to restore your status. Um, this precludes refugee claimants who do not have temporary status from being able to apply under this category. Um, also to be present in Canada at the time of application and when the application is approved. I wouldn't necessarily say that this means you can never leave Canada while you're waiting for your application. It's just at the time of application, you should be in Canada. Hopefully, you know, you can travel a little bit but don't really reside outside of Canada because if you reside, if you are outside of the country and they make a decision on your case, then at that point, there could be an issue. The score, the language score is a CLB of four, which is quite, it's, it's quite low uh, for immigration. The problem is, is that a lot of people uh, may not have your scores already. Right. And so we're going to be talking about that afterwards. What happens if you can't, you haven't been able to book your IELTS or self FIP, right? What happens then? Because the, um, the, the issue is, is there, there are quotas. I suspect that the students one, uh, we, we were talking about, I think students one is going to go really, really fast. But the worker one, because it is limited to certain work experience, a lot of people may not have their IELTS or self -hip yet, you um, may be able to have some time, even if you don't have time to get your results by the May 6th deadline, maybe. This is just purely my Elizabeth speculation. I could be proven wrong, but maybe you might have some time to get your English results uh, before the quota is filled out. Okay, we'll see. Uh, again, intent to live outside of Quebec. Now, why do they have this? It's because Quebec has a special immigration program where they decide all of their programs as to who can live in Quebec. None of the federal programs or any programs from outside of the province can decide who lives in Quebec. Okay, so you have to show that you intend to not live in Quebec once you have your permanent residence. Um, and so, um, you know, that's, that's very, very important there. All right, so we have the quota for 20,000 for stream A, 30,000 for stream B, and this is only for English speakers. If you are lucky enough 
to be able to pass the French exam. And the French exam actually is not very high for this, the CLB4. Not to say you can learn French in two weeks, okay? Don't, don't think about doing something like that. But if you do have some pretty moderate French, it might be worth it for you to go and do your French exam. You do have until November 5th, I believe. Is it November 5th to submit your application? Um, it may or may not be the, the government has reserved the right to close the program earlier, but if you there, because there is no quota for French speakers, you may still have some time to go and get your French score if you qualify under this category. Okay. All right, Zia. Let's yeah. Advice so, now that we've gone through the criteria, wanted to talk a little bit about what you need to do now, right? So we know that these, all of these streams are supposed to be opening on May 6th, okay? Um, right now, IRCC has not released any information as to the forms that they're gonna need or the documents that they're gonna require, but it is important to still be ready to submit that application when the program does open on May 6th, okay? there's only a limited number of spots, right? We've seen that for the English speaking side, for anyone who's relying on English language results, there's a total of 90,000 spots, okay? And so the thought, like Elizabeth talked about a little bit earlier, um, is that these programs are gonna fill up quickly or likely going to fill up quickly. And so when the program opens on May 6th, you do wanna be ready with an application so that you're able to submit it as soon as these programs, as soon as these streams do open. What, now, we, are, what we are seeing, sorry, Zia, to, to interrupt you, but I was just um, thinking that, you know, we don't know what the system is going to be, whether they'll give you time to submit your application, but from what it seems like, um, from the, what they have published, it seems like they want you, they're going to take the first, uh, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 complete applications. So it's not like you have time to say, oh, you know, I don't have my IELTS, I'll give it to you later. We, we don't know for sure, but it doesn't seem like they're going to give you a chance to do that. Yeah, exactly. And that's it, right? Like right now we just, we don't have that instruction as yet. Um, but from what we see from the policies, we think that it will be that they're looking specifically at complete applications. And so as soon as they do hit their quota, then that'll be that'll be the end of these programs. And these are very unique programs. I don't think we've seen anything like this in, in the recent past. And so certainly it is a huge advantage to individuals who are here in Canada and are able to qualify and apply. Now, when you do submit your application, you want to make sure that it is absolutely perfect. Okay, this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to qualify under these uh, temporary policies and you know there's no guarantee that it's ever going to come back. Um, so you want to make sure that that application that you do submit you're taking advantage of these programs and that the application is complete and perfect so that you avoid the risk of having that application rejected or returned by IRCC because by that point, by the time that they've actually gone through it and come back with that refusal or rejected it for being incomplete, um, likely the program's gonna be full and we won't be able to resubmit at that point. Yeah, now, I, we can't really rely on immigration to say, oh, wait a minute, you're missing this document. Please send us this document because the immigration rules are such that they don't have to. The duty is on you to submit an uh, application that proves your case. Yeah. And even if it's not on the document checklist, but it doesn't, your case is not proven, too bad, it's up to you, that's your problem, okay? So your application has to have everything that proves your case. And in fact, I think the idea behind these programs is really for them to be able to uh, finalize applications sooner rather than later, right? I think that this is part of their target for 2021. And so, you know, I think that you're going to, we're going to see officers really just going through it very quickly and, and saying, okay, hey, do you have everything? Do you, uh, are you able to demonstrate that you meet the criteria? If not, uh, reject or refuse. 
I think we're going to see a lot of that, unfortunately. And then, of course, our last piece of advice is, is to have a backup plan. Um, you know, there is a limit in, in the number of applications that they will accept. Um, and so in case you aren't able to make it into the quota, have a backup plan, know what else you do qualify for. Our advice to anyone at all times is, you know, have a plan A, but make sure you also have a plan B and C ready uh, in case plan A changes or you're not able to apply through it. So same applies here, right? It's, this is a great program. If you are eligible, certainly prepare and be ready for it. But at the same time, you know, uh, ensure that you have a backup plan ready as well. So speaking of backup plans, um, let me just quickly just run through some things just so that you don't try to lower your anxiety a little bit. I know this is really stressful and nervous and exciting, but just in case it doesn't work, there are there's life after this program, okay? So uh, first of all, good news is express entry points. They are lowering dramatically. I think it was a 417 was the last draw for Canadian experience class. While everybody was concentrated on these new policies, this came in. And I think it's just gonna continue to lower because this new policy has, um, you know, has been invited. And the number of uh, people they invited was 6,000 which is much higher than before, which was normally around 3,000. So it could, and I would very much expect that if they continue on with inviting people only under a Canadian experience class, which it looks like that's what they're looking at for the points to continue to lower, which is great news as well. But, you know, under the Canadian experience class, it does require high skilled work experience. Okay. Um, we have, and, and uh, Z and I have both um, attended uh, a, a exciting um, new EOI system. It was uh, information system, uh, information session that the Ontario government has um, invited uh, lawyers to attend. And it was um, that they are putting in a new system for the employer based as well the master's and PhD programs. For those of you in Ontario, if you have heard about this, you know, we always talk about this in our webinars. These are the Ontario Provincial Nominee programs. And in the past few years, to get a spot in some of these programs was like buying the hottest ticket on Ticketmaster, you know? It was like, you see if you have the high internet speed and, you know, get all your friends and family to try to just grab a spot for you. The good news is Ontario has recognized that this is not fair, it's not um, desirable, and they have put they are going to put in a new system. They had said that they were going to start it in April. I don't know with all this fuss about the the new programs if they're still going to do that. But uh, for the students and the Ontario employer, um, uh, sorry, the uh, was it the worker one, this, yeah. the international worker one, and the students, and the master's, right? For the master's and PhD, they're talking about opening in the summer. Um, right now, they're looking first at, their first stage is basically opening the employer-based uh, streams. Yes, in demand is also summer, but the, right, the students... I think they, well, during my call with them, they spoke specifically about all the employer streams. Um, okay. But I think right now we're still waiting to see when they release their further. And they actually. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes. Um, but that's, it's, so what they're doing is they're going to have a new system where there's going to have uh, a points based system, but age, they have said, is not one of the factors. Um, so, you know, today, what we are telling you is what we know of today. Um, a lot of policies, a lot of new laws are going to come out. We have signed you guys all up for our newsletter with new immigration changes. And um, if you wanted to tell other people to sign up or if you don't get something from us, then uh, please do feel free to go to our website and sign up for the newsletter where you, a lot of you would have uh, received our pop, uh, the, the newsletter about this policy and we'll be sending you out new things for example, when the OIMP opens with the new EOI systems. Uh, caregiver applications that have been hold for almost two years, a year and a half, the government has finally announced that they're going to be starting to process these. And so for a lot of um, PSWs 
and um, for uh, a lot of caregivers who are taking care of children, um, you can also start looking at these programs to be processed and possibly to apply under this. The RNIP as well, for those of you who um, are up in, you know, the, the northern communities, um, Sioux College, and we know, I know we have a lot of Sioux College students here, so Sioux St. Marie has a great RNIP program, um, and, uh, you know, North Bay, um, so if you, uh, Sudbury, if so, if you guys are in one of those uh, places, we, and you have a job offer there, we may be able to look at some of the options under these programs as well for you guys, okay? Um, just listing a few other things, self-employed artists and athletes, okay? There are programs for you. Startup visa for those who are um, interested in starting a, a business, an innovative business that can receive the support of an incubator or an angel investor group. Um, there are some great, this is a great program. Um, and there are other um, entrepreneur programs, et cetera. So do let us know. Um, right now, we have been quite busy with um, having some calls with a lot of you who have contacted us and told us that you may qualify. Right now, what we're doing with the public policy is we are scheduling some short calls with you guys just to talk about public policy and see if you qualify. Um, and if so, then, you know, we can, uh, we can, we can see. If you don't qualify, do email us anyway, and we can set up a consultation for you guys to go over a deep dive into a good plan for you as well. Um, and so for the consultations, do let us know that you came to this webinar so that I can give you a discount, okay, on the consultation fee. All right, let us start this question and answer period. All right, we've gotten some great questions. We have over 274 questions. Wow, you guys, <laughs> this is amazing. Okay, so we definitely can't answer 274 questions, but we will try our best to answer some uh, questions that we think a lot of people, other, a lot of people will have, okay? So um, what we're gonna do, how about we do something like this? Zia, you want to pick a question for me to answer, and sure. then I'll pick a question for you, and we'll go until um, we get to the end of the session, all right? Okay. So one question I have here is, right now with IELTS or CELPIP, is it uh, academic, general, um, and what? how long are they valid for? So um, it's general, valid for two years. Okay. Perfect. Start off simple. Simple. Great. Uh, so how long, how long do you think the applications are going to stay open? I, that's the million dollar question. That is really the million dollar question right now. I wish I had a crystal ball. I personally, I don't think that they're going to stay open very long. Um, Elizabeth, I know you think that the, the students one is going to finish first. I think possibly both of them are going to see finish very quickly. Um, this is why, you know, our advice is really prepare that application now, be ready so that May 6th, you're able to apply as soon as it does open. Okay. Okay, Elizabeth, for you, um, if someone has applied already for permanent residence through Express Entry or Provincial Nominee Program, are they able to apply again? Yes. So far, we have not seen any restrictions in the government pol stated policies. Again, this is what we have seen so far. Um, but uh, so far, it looks like you can apply, like most other immigration programs, you can apply both. You only get one PR in the end, but you can try your luck with different ones. And the first one that gives you the PR, that's, that's the one that, but you have to pay the application fees for both. Okay, Zia, um, how about police certificates and medicals? Will, do you think that they'll have to submit those? It's a good question. I, I think it may be part of the application. Again, this is really looking at um, trying to finalize applications as quick as possible. And when we look at Express Entry, um, which is the other one where you know we've seen that expedited route, uh, police certificates and medicals have been needed for both of those. So it is a possibility that they may be required for this application as well. 
Elizabeth, are students who are graduating in April or finishing that program, I should say, in April eligible for this program? Ah, that was that was what I wanted to ask you. <laughs> I took my question. Okay, so here's the thing, okay? You have to show evidence that you have completed your program. What kind of evidence can you show? Um, you can show your transcripts that says that you've completed. You can show a letter from the school that has says that you completed on that date. I think the completion date, the letter, when you have completed it, um, that's very important. I think basically, let's let's say we, we do something like this, okay? By May 6th, let's say you receive a letter after May 6th that says that you have uh, completed it before May 6th. What does, how does that work? Good question. I myself can't give you a final answer, but maybe what I might do is I may submit the application and follow it up with the letter. That may or may not work, okay? But if you complete it after May 6th and you submit it before you complete it, that I think would be an issue, that I think your, your application may be denied. I think the second part to it, Elizabeth, just to add to what you're saying is the timing of it, right? Because not only do you need to have completed your program, but you also do have to have authorization to work in Canada as well, right? And so it's not just completing the program and being done uh, that, you know, having received your final marks or having received anything that shows it. You also have to have applied for that postgrad work permit or have other authorization to work in order to qualify for this, right? Because yeah. The other aspects of eligibility are um, one, having authorization to work and two, being currently employed, right? So yes. I think all of that, I think it's really for, for those of you who are finishing your program of study right now, it really is going to be a timing issue. You're absolutely right. Because if you don't have that letter, you can't, I mean, you could submit it uh, and follow it up for your postgrad work permit, but it could be rejected, right? So your postgrad work permit, you have to apply with something to show you've completed your program. You can only apply after you completed your program. You need to have submitted the postgrad work permit in order to have the ability to work, right? Some people say, oh, I have a co-op work permit. No, the co-op work permit does not allow you to work in anything other than a co-op program. So there is a lot of issues for those of you who are finishing in April to try to get everything in and received by May 6th. All right. Uh, my question. Um, okay. Let's take a look here. Um, so does everyone have to take the IELTS self -IP what it, can they have anything to substitute for that? Yeah, so this is a common question right now because you know we're just seeing that the IELTS, you can't register, it seems like you can't register anymore for the IELTS or self -IP just because they're inundated with, with people taking the test. Um, right now, based on the policies and, and what we've seen so far, if you're trying to apply through the English speaking streams, you do need a language test and the only acceptable language test are that IELTS general or self of general tests that are taken in the last two years. So right now there doesn't seem to be any um, alternative documents. So, you know, having studied here or studying English, um, none of that is, is really acceptable and hasn't been acceptable in the past for uh, alternatives to language tests. Uh, Elizabeth, do you need WES or an education assessment for this policy? No, you do not, period, <laughs> because as a student, it's all about whether you graduate in Canada, and as a worker, it's not required. The first time, we don't need less. <laughs> wow, <laughs> great. Okay, um, in terms of the work, does it have to be full-time? So 
No, it doesn't. I mean, we see work as being part of two different parts, right? When we're talking about students, you have to be currently employed. And like we talked about earlier, there's nothing in the policy that says that it has to be full-time uh, or that part-time is not accepted. So it looks like you can be either part-time or full-time and you know, it doesn't restrict, it doesn't seem to restrict currently working in a low-skilled occupation. Same for if we turn over to the worker categories, um, nothing there says that it has to be full-time throughout. You do have to have the minimum of a year. So if you were working part-time, then you do have to hit that 1,560 hours like Elizabeth talked about earlier, but part-time work does count towards that as well. Um, okay, so my question for you, how long do we think it's going to take for these applications to be processed? Hmm. Well, that's, a, that's again, uh, a speculation question. We speculate that because this policy was announced to try to fill the 401,000 spots that the minister has said that's their goal to fill this year, that in order to satisfy that goal, these applications will need to be processed this year. So, of course, there are also always anomalies, but I think we speculate that the goal is for the government to try to process everything by this year, which would be incredibly fast um, in terms of immigration. Um, Zia, in terms of work experience while they are a student, are they going to be able to use that? Yeah, that's definitely one of the exciting things is that when we look at the public policy for, um, for workers and we're talking about having experience in Annex A or Annex B, um, it doesn't talk about needing to hold a work permit. You just need to, it needs to be legal work experience. So international students who have the study permit and are able to work using that study permit can actually still use that work experience to qualify under the, um, the public policy for foreign workers, right? And so, you know, we see occupations like cashiers included in there. So if you've worked part-time while you're a student, um, as a cashier over the last, let's say, year and a half, that might qualify you to uh, under the one of the um, stream A or stream Bs. Um, okay, Elizabeth, if I've done only a one year postgrad certificate, can I apply? Um, most of the time, no, unless it is something to deal with this Annex A. So I'm going to be sending you all the slides. It's going to be recorded. But on the slides, uh, for those of you who have registered for this, um, we, uh, I will hyperlink the policies on there so you can see that Annex A, go in there and you can see the ones. So most of the Annex A's are in the, they're all in the trades, um, construction trades, cooks, chefs uh, are for the most part. Um, so if it's not that, you would have had to do a one plus one uh, in order to satisfy the students one. You may qualify for the work permit one, uh, workers one, uh, but uh, that, you know, that, that's, that'll re remain to be seen for yourself. Um, okay, so let's say um, someone holds a, um, okay. Actually, let's 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 do this. Um, sorry, I had a question in there. Do you have another question? <laughs> yeah, because I had a question and then I lost it. Sure, no problem. Yeah, I got um, it down. Yeah. yeah. There's definitely so many <laughs> great questions that are coming in. Um, okay, so if do we know right now if this is going to look like express entry, where you have to create an, a profile in a pool? Um, and then get invited? I don't think so. It's not about the pool. It's not about your points. There are no points scoring on this. It's first come first serve, which is good and bad because it's going to be exciting day on um, May 6th. I can tell you that. I think it'd probably be an exciting hour when it opens and then it's going to be heartbreak afterwards. That's what I think, but well, well, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Everyone here will follow our advice and be prepared and ready on May. <laughs> yeah, 
yeah. Um, so, um, do unpaid internships count as employment? No, unfortunately, the it does have to meet the definition of work, which in, which only includes paid work experience. So, unpaid internships, um, unfortunately, will not meet the requirement for for work under the uh, worker streams. Um, okay, so Elizabeth, um, let's see here. If someone completes 1,560 hours in eight months, right, so they haven't been employed for the full 12 months, um, are they eligible? I was just looking at the same question. <laughs> and no, unfortunately, even if you work 60 hours a week, it, you won't qualify. So it, the rule is one year, at least 52 weeks. And then you, and then you also need the hours as well. Uh, Zia, what if someone is working in Canada, but their employer is outside of the country? Would so that physically located here, but their employer, they're not employed in Canada. Yeah, so they're not, their employer is not in Canada. So again, this goes back to the definition of work. And unfortunately, it would not count. Uh, so it wouldn't qualify you. Elizabeth, what if they're physically here, but studying at a, at a college or university outside? That's okay. Um, they're, they're physically in Canada, but they're studying at a school in some other country. Okay. But, the yeah, as long as you don't use that to apply for your students. So if you're yeah. currently, oh, oh, okay. So you're you're wondering if you you graduating remotely from a school outside of Canada? No, no, no. no. It has to, the 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 list of schools is very specific. So private schools, for the most part, will not count. Okay. Um, it, it has to be a school, a private school, unless it leads to a degree. Um, so it's mostly public universities and colleges. The program itself, at least two years. ESL does not count. Okay. So be, it has to be very, very specific as the programs and the schools definitely has to be in Canada. Okay, Zia, yeah. if someone falls under both policies, what should they do? That was going to be my next question. Oh, okay. <laughs> we think, um, we've been working together for too long. We think to like. <laughs> um, so if they qualify under both, I haven't seen, I don't know if you've seen anything, Elizabeth, but I haven't seen anything restricting people from applying in two different categories. It may be tough to do it on that day, but I, I think technically it's allowed. Have you seen anything else? For, for both? I don't know if you have time to, to do both. That's what I mean. You know? <laughs> if, you, if you are lucky enough to put yourself, you only need one to qualify. Yeah. I, would, I would concentrate on just doing one because it's going to be hard enough to get a spot in one, I think. Definitely. Um, how far back can we look for the work experience for the, um, the worker streams? Three years. Three years from the date of application. So you're looking at May 6, 2018, okay? Um, can we talk a little bit about French? What do you think about these lucky French people, the French-speaking applicants? Um, yeah, so yeah. certainly I think that there's going to be less of a rush. Um, typically, I think the French-speaking programs, like if I look at Ontario, for example, even um, with the OYMP program, those streams are generally open longer than the English speaking streams. And so I don't think we're gonna see as much of a rush to get uh, you know, to close these streams. Now, like you said earlier, the end date, so the, the last date for application is November 5th, but the IRCC does reserve the right to close it earlier. So I think basically you're going to have more of an opportunity uh, to apply through the French streams. Um, okay. Let's see here. We're seeing a lot of questions about um, just to confirm for international students who have worked during their uh, studies and that they can use this for uh, the purposes of meeting the foreign worker or for the worker streams. Mm -hmm. 
Um, Hezia, we have some, a lot of questions about what uh, documents someone might need to show in order to show that they finished their program, especially if they don't have their degree yet. Yeah, I mean, we're still waiting to get that official list from IRCC to say exactly what documents they're looking for um, for this application. If we're looking specifically at uh, being able to demonstrate that you've completed your program, typically what we would see is a completion letter from the school, um, final uh, grades, so final transcripts. Um, those are really the two that we would first see. So I think that's kind of where we're looking for, I think right now, until we have that official word from IRCC as to what they're, they're actually going to make mandatory for these applications. Mm -hmm. I think those are those two really showcase uh, the two main things that we want to see. One, that you completed your program, and B, what kind of program was it? Was it a two-year? Was it a one-year? Was it eight months, etc.? Okay, is it your turn or my turn? <laughs> oh, we've gone to... I think we've gotten off our, our track here. <laughs> hey, does Uber driving count as self-employed? Oh, they've had this question. I think, I think it does. I think it, I think it does. If you're, you have your own car, you have your own tools, right? Normally then you're, you're controlling your, 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 your trade. And normally it, it is counted as, as self-employed unfortunately. So to, to build off of that, Elizabeth, can you talk a little bit about what the difference is between someone who's an employee and self-employed? Right. So basically, a lot of it is grounded in the, the tax laws. Um, but it, it's basically for if you are self-employed, you own your tools, you own your business, you direct yourself as to what to do. And if you are employed, your employer controls, controls what you do. Um, and most of the time they are giving your tools to you. They give you a computer, they give you whatnot. But a lot of times there are gray zones. In general, for immigration, the officers are basically looking for a T4. If you don't have a T4, it's a very hard road to climb uh, to show that you are not uh, self-employed. Although sometimes um, research assistants, uh, you know, you might get a T5, I think, or T4A, or it's something for like the 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 um, fellowships. That I think the the courts have determined that you're still employed in that situation. Uh, but for the most part, if you are getting a, uh, a T4A, I think then that's more, or a T5, I can't remember, T4, but you're not getting a T4, that's for sure, okay? <laughs> then um, then the officers in general will say, well, you're, you're self-employed. Also, you know, if you open up your company and then just hire yourself, that's also self-employed as well. I have another one for you, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. If I'm looking at my background and I say, okay, yes, I can see that I qualify for a Canadian experience class. I qualify for one of these public policies. I qualify for a provincial nominee program. How do I know what I should apply for? That's a good question. Um, you need to seek some advice. <laughs> That's what I can say. You know, a lot of times we, we kind of get greedy. We're like, oh, I apply, I can apply for three or four different programs. And, you know, that's great. The more programs I apply, the better. Um, every program has their pros and cons. And you only need to qualify for one and be successful in one. If you're going to apply for a lot of different programs, A, it's going to be expensive. And it may be unnecessary expense. And every program has their own uh, nuances. For example, provincial nominee programs will often require you to remain in the province. They may require you to be working for, the, for an employer, the same employer. Um, you know, this public policy, they'll require you to be in Canada. What if you don't want to be in Canada, right? What if you don't want to? So um, in general, I 
I mean, everyone is different. Sometimes I do advise people to do two um, in case, you know, one is a backup, one is security, but the other one you'll get processed a lot faster. Um, but you also always should have a backup plan, especially for these public policies, because unless you, unless French is, you know, there for you, um, then you're lucky enough not to have the quota. Everybody else is a quota. And who knows? Who knows what's going to happen? If you have applied the list through, through multiple programs, and you know, you mentioned the cost of um, applying to multiple ones, to multiple streams. So let's say we applied through CEC before, and now we're doing the public policy. You only get permanent residence once, right? Yeah. You can't get permanent residence through both. Like both of them are not going to be approved. What happens to your application fees? Uh, so you have to pay your application fees. You could get your right of permanent residence fee, the $500. You could get that back, but the other fees you have to apply. And a lot of people, you know, you're right now the express entry. Some people are just stuck in express entry right now. Mm -hmm. And you might feel like, oh, if I apply under this new public policy, it might get processed faster because you said it should be processed this year and this is a priority processing. It depends on why your application is stuck. A lot of people are stuck not because of eligibility. It's because of, sec because of security issues, right? Right now, for example, a lot of Chinese applicants, we're seeing that a lot of their applications are taking much slower to process. It may be, and most of the time, it's not because of um, eligibility. It's clear that they are eligible. The problem is, is that sometimes the security certificate, not the police certificates, but after the police certificates, Canada's uh, CSIS, our version of the CIA, goes and investigates a person um, and needs to get security information back from their country of origin. And sometimes it may take a while for them to gather this information. And that's why a um, application is stuck. If your application is stuck because of something like this, applying to a new program is not going to help because you'll have to go through the same thing for another program as well. Perfect. I've just got a, um, an update here from IDP IELTS. So they're basically saying it's a, it's a booking website right now. Um, they're, they're working on the booking website and they're gradually updating extra speed availability for April and May. So we've been oh. requested to encourage students to keep checking the website if they need their IELTS test. Um, if it's an online exam, it will take three to five days to get the results. So there's some All hope. right, you heard it here first. <laughs> you heard it here first. Go and try, go and try. Yeah, so basically keep checking that website. We are seeing that, uh, that there are spots opening up. Wow, that's amazing. That's amazing. So. Hey, there's still hope yet. Um, okay, one last question. Um, what if someone is employed, but they can't work because of COVID right now? What do you think? That's a tricky one. I know we've been discussing this ourselves. Um, technically, the, the public policy right now says that you have to be currently employed. And so we've gone back and forth to say, well, what does that mean, right? Um, a lot of people right now, you know, we, we see these lockdowns happening and the result of that means people being on leave or having to, or losing their job for the period of time that the lockdowns are happening. You know, the safest way to say it is, is if you have another job, use that job as part of your application. Um, if not, you can put in an explanation as to what the situation is, but whether or not IRCC is going to accept it and still approve applications, um, we don't know right now. Yeah, we, we do have meetings as part of the uh, Canadian Bar Association uh, with IRCC about these programs and a lot of these questions are being posed to IRCC. Um, so uh, it remains to be seen, um, but our time is up today. Thank you all for joining us and thank you all for posing such great questions. Uh, all the best and do let us know if uh, we can help you as well in your journey. Okay, take care guys. Thank you. Okay, bye-bye.